On the outskirts of London exists the town of Staines upon Thames. With a population of 18,000, it is far from the most well known place in the United Kingdom. But on June 18, 1972, the small town was thrusted into the national spotlight. The town of Staines became the scene of what was and still is to this day the deadliest air accident to occur on British soil. British European Airways Flight 548 crashed just minutes after takeoff. It was supposed to be a short flight, one of less than an hour to Brussels. So what went wrong? Well, for that, we need to rewind the clock that day, which brings us to Heathrow Airport. So how did things end up in disaster so quickly? It would turn out there are many layers to this story. But before we get there, we need to have a quick talk about the plane involved. There once was a time when the United Kingdom played a large role in the aviation industry globally. The UK in the 20th century produced some of the best planes around and even pioneered some of the technology that has built aviation into what it is today. There were in fact multiple British manufacturers that saw success on a global scale. Many British planes were at the forefront of new technology. For example, British manufacturer Vickers Armstrong built what is credited as being the first commercial turboprop plane. And who could forget the introduction of the first jetliner, the de Havilland Comet, which is something we need to talk about someday. Another accolade that Britain holds in aviation is that of the first commercial trijet plane. And here at Disaster Breakdown, we are going to need to familiarize ourselves with this plane in question, not just for this video, but also an additional video coming very soon. So enter the Hawker Siddeley HS-121, commonly known as the Trident. The Trident first took to the skies in 1962, beating the Boeing 727 by a whole year, making it the first commercial trijet to fly, but it wasn't flying regular commercial flights until 1964, roughly the same time as the 727. It was developed as a jet plane for short and medium range routes. The Trident was designed by de Havilland. That company was consolidated into Hawker Siddeley, who eventually began manufacturing the plane in the early 1960s. The Trident doesn't just get its name from its three engines, but just generally there was a rule of three philosophy when this plane was developed. Three engines, three pilots, three hydraulics, three autopilots, and so on. The Trident really was a wholly British plane. It was powered by three Rolls-Royce engines, and the largest operator of the type was British European Airways. The Trident was the most advanced plane for its day. To correct a previous disaster breakdown video, this was the first passenger plane to come equipped with an auto land function, in addition to instrument landing capabilities. Basically, the Trident was the first passenger plane that could land itself. It was something that was installed onto this plane because British Airlines often needed to delay flights in the UK because of poor weather. The Autoland was seen as a solution for the UK's notoriously bad meteorological conditions. But it wasn't the only new piece of technology on the plane. The Trident cockpit featured a redesigned control wheel. This ram's head style control wheel was made to give pilots a better and easier view of their instruments. A similar shape and style of control wheel would later be used by Embraer and is featured on their planes today. A then revolutionary method of navigation was also present on board. The plane's computers could display where the plane was on this moving map panel, something that is more reminiscent of the digital flight decks of today. The plane came with so much technology for the early 1960s and took up so much space in the cockpit and nose of the plane that the front landing gear had to be shifted off center and swing sideways to be stowed to accommodate all of this stuff. The Trident was certainly ahead of its time. Pertinent to our discussion today and something to bear in mind for later is that the Trident was also fitted with additional stall recovery technology that can automatically push the pilot's control wheel forward in the event of a stall scenario. It's called the stick push. Just take a moment to put a pin in that point of the plane for now. We'll need it later on. Despite this, the plane when compared to say the Boeing 727 
and even other British airliners like the BAC-111, the Hawker Siddeley Trident was not as popular. Across all of its variants, a total of 117 Tridents were built. British European Airways, or BEA for short, operated 70 of these planes. Many were subsequently transferred to British Airways in 1974. Interestingly, the plane did see some success in China of all places. The state-owned Chinese airline flew over 30 Tridents in their fleet. So now that we've had a quick look at the Trident, we should examine the Flight 548 disaster. For this, we should turn our attention to London Heathrow Airport. The date was June 18th, 1972. London Heathrow was the hub for British European Airways, who were based out of the old Terminal 1 at the airport. It was 3 in the afternoon and that Sunday the weather was overcast. Typical British weather. A BEA Trident was boarding for the afternoon flight to Brussels, flying as Flight 548. The Trident requires three pilots to fly, the standard at the time. 51-year-old Captain Stanley Key had a military background before joining civil aviation. He served in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War. He was one of the most senior pilots at British European Airways, with over 15,000 flight hours to his name. Over the years, he had found himself as a real representative of the BEA airline, and was even present to defend Captain James Thane, who survived British European Airways Flight 609, a plane crash in Munich in 1958. We have a video on that if you'd like to learn more about that story. Captain Key, that fateful day in 1972, was flying with two younger pilots, which according to the accident report, both held the position of second officer. Occupying the right-hand seat was the youngest member of the flight crew, 22-year-old Jeremy Keeley. He was obviously much less experienced. In fact, he was a new hire at the airline and new to the Trident plane. The third member of the flight crew was not a flight engineer per se, as is typically the case on these older planes, Instead, it was just a third pilot position, whose job was actually to monitor the other pilots. They did have access to a systems panel which acted pretty much the same as a flight engineer station. Seated in this position was another young pilot, 24-year-old Simon Ticehurst. He was a bit more experienced with around 1,500 hours logged, with around half of those in this plane. Additional pilots found themselves occupying the jump seats. Not on duty as pilots, they were being ferried to Brussels for a different flight. Now that we've established who was flying the plane, we have to understand that there is a rather unique area of this accident that we need to explore. The disaster of Flight 548 can't really be discussed without breaking down what happened before the pilots got on the plane that day. So, a bit of context. Pressure was mounting in the pilot labor unions over multiple issues relating to pay and aviation safety. The following day, in fact, June 19th, was declared to be a worldwide pilot strike to highlight the growing trend of hijackings at the time. For British pilots, a pilot strike was on the table to demand higher salaries. This was a strike that Captain Key was staunchly against. Strike action was something that he opposed out of principle. He saw it as unprofessional. His views on strike action would evidently become known amongst other pilots. You could imagine this as a divide that was created between the younger generation of pilots keen for change and the old guard. Captain Key himself was seen as a conservative man amongst his work colleagues. After all, he was nearly 30 years older than his two co-pilots on the Axton flight. He was someone who was known for doing everything by the book, did as he was told, and didn't stray too far off of that path. Perhaps his military background had something to do with that. It's believed that Captain Key was the type of man who would look at his younger pilots as naive, ungrateful, or even irresponsible for not carrying out their duties, instead choosing to go out on strike. The kind of attitude that even lurks in today's society when similar social discourse arises. I'm sure we've all either encountered or know of this type of attitude. Probably a good example and indication of this divide was later found within the wreckage of the aircraft. Graffiti was found scribbled onto the table located at the flight engineer's position toward the rear of the cockpit. 
This graffiti was later published in the British tabloids, and this is what it looked like. The accident report describes this graffiti as offensive scribbles, some of which was personally directed towards Captain Stanley Key. It read, Key must go. Yes, but where? Down the drain? BOAC? Anywhere will do. Other comments in the graffiti appear to be directed at other BEA employees, presumably pilots. The graffiti was reported to have been in the cockpit for roughly two weeks before the accident, and we don't know for certain who actually made the graffiti, but handwriting analysis suggested that it most closely resembled the handwriting of 2nd Officer Simon Ticehurst, who would occupy the flight engineer's position on Flight 548. Investigators stopped short of conclusively saying that this was the case, but Captain Stanley Key never worked at this position in the cockpit, and it's unclear if he ever saw it. This all reached a critical boiling point on the day of the accident amongst BEA pilots. Roughly 90 minutes before Flight 548 was scheduled to depart, there was an incident in the BEA crew room. As Captain Key arrived preparing for his flight, he was approached by another first officer, not on board the accident flight. This first officer attempted to engage in what I would like to call here a bit of worker solidarity. He engaged in casual conversation about the looming pilot strike, something that Captain Key evidently did not appreciate. Multiple witnesses to this incident would later come forward to testify that Captain Key erupted into an anger-induced outburst where he let this first officer have a piece of his mind, shall we say. This was an incident the very young co-pilot Jeremy Keeley of Flight 548 was witness to. It is reported that he apologized afterward, but it's likely that this argument had an effect on the captain. So with all of that said, there is yet another side to this we are yet to discuss, and it's in relation to the actual physical health of Captain Key. Later, during the investigation, pathologists determined that Captain Key had undiagnosed atherosclerosis. It's a disease that can go undetected for decades, and symptoms typically begin to show up in middle age. Basically, it is a result from a buildup of fat tissue on the walls of artery blood vessels. This can, at its peak, restrict blood flow, therefore restricting the delivery of oxygenated blood around the body. It's important to note here that medical experts were left conflicted with how to interpret this information. However, it is the opinion of some investigators, and broadly speaking the wider general public, that at some point before the disaster, Captain Key was experiencing some form of heart failure, specifically a hemorrhage induced by increased blood pressure rupturing his arteries, and this affected his performance as a pilot during the short accident flight. As time went on, he would have experienced more pain, something that could easily distract him from flying an aeroplane. Basically, as we'll soon find out, he wasn't his usual self when it came to pilot performance that day. This could easily have been exacerbated from the argument in the crew room, raising his blood pressure so it is absolutely well within the realm of possibility that Captain Key's outburst before the flight and his underlying deteriorating physical health are linked. The thing is, we can't know this for certain. Further evidence that would have helped in arriving at a solid conclusion here would have been available if British planes in 1972 were required to have a cockpit voice recorder installed. At the time, they weren't required, and the accident plane never had one. If there was ever an example case study accident that demonstrates the need for a cockpit voice recorder, it would be this one. Not only for examining the captain's performance here, but it may have given further insight into the, well, you could say toxic atmosphere that was created amongst the pilots, and how that may have played a role. The Trident, though, was fitted with two flight data recorders, and we will be looking at some of that data later in this video. So further insight into the actions of the pilots as the disaster unfolded was unavailable. Still, this all paints a very compelling narrative, but even if there was full incapacitation of the captain at a critical point, this was not the cause of this disaster. It was merely a contributing underlying factor. So we should really, at this point, finally move to the accident flight itself. 
The time was precisely 3.39 in the afternoon. Flight 548 was given their clearances. At 4 o'clock, the plane was pushed back from the gate, and over the next minutes, the Trident was taxied out to what was labelled at the time as runway 28 right, the westerly departure on the northern side of Heathrow. Immediately following the takeoff, Flight 548 was expected to make a left-hand turn to the south. They were to pass over the multiple reservoirs nearby to Heathrow Airport before flying over the town of Staines upon Thames. Before takeoff, the pilots would have executed the pre-flight checklists, which calls for the leading edge and trailing edge flaps to be deployed. This is a key point of interest in this accident. The Hawker Siddeley Trident has a rather unique method of configuring the flaps. Many planes have a single flap lever, which actuates the flap hydraulics for both the leading and trailing edge wing flaps. As we've mentioned in previous videos, flaps create a physically larger wing that can generate more lift. They are critical during the takeoff phase and need to be deployed accordingly. The Trident had two flap levers to control the leading and trailing edge flaps independently. There was the flap lever which extends the flaps at the back of the wings, then there was the droop lever. The droops were the leading edge flaps on the Trident. They are not the same as what you may already know as slats on other aircraft, though they are similar. The droop flap in this case effectively brings the entire leading edge as one flap forward to give the similar effect of increased lift whilst also increasing wing performance in high angle of attack situations. On flight 548, the plane was configured correctly for takeoff. At 408 in the afternoon, the plane was rolling down the runway. Once in the air, Captain Stanley Key banked the plane to the left as per their flight plan. There are a number of strict rules that apply to Heathrow and its departure. In this case, the pilots needed to follow noise abatement procedures. This called for the engine power to be reduced 90 seconds after the takeoff to reduce noise pollution over residential areas. It's a practice that's rather common at many airports, even today. The pilots should also have followed airspeed recommendations, and on this day, the plane flew slower than normal. Captain Stanley Key, the one at the flight controls, was believed to have been under the effects of his undiagnosed heart condition. This could easily have contributed to his underperforming piloting at this moment. In comparison to other flights he has done, he was known at the airline for being efficient and he'd usually perform textbook departures from Heathrow. Just like his radio transmissions, on this occasion he was exhibiting poor performance as a pilot. Again, this was unusual for him. But it's what happened next that really set the events in motion for quick disaster. You see, after takeoff and assuming the pilots are following the recommended airspeeds, the flaps should be retracted. In this case, it was to be done incrementally, and according to the data interpreted from the flight data recorders, the flaps were being brought in as to be expected. Flight 548's airspeed was already below the recommended. When the engine power was reduced 90 seconds after takeoff, as per the noise abatement requirements, the next stage of flaps were also expected to be raised. And it was at this point that a critical error was made on the flight deck. Basically, what happened here was that at too low a speed, the droop lever was inadvertently raised. We don't know who raised the droop flap. In theory, though, it should have been the co-pilot, Jeremy Keeley. However, the investigation also believed that Captain Key could easily have done this as well if he was under a growing pain affecting his judgment. Obviously, the plane responded accordingly, and the droops were brought in. This decreased the size of the wing and therefore decreased lift output, enough so to the point that the plane was now outside of its flight envelope. The aircraft was at far too low an airspeed to operate without the droops extended. They were roughly 60 knots short of a safe airspeed to execute the droop retraction. The pilots had inadvertently brought themselves into a stall scenario, and the plane began to drop. At no point from here on out would the droops be re-extended. Flight 548 had entered an aerodynamic stall it would not recover from. This is what is called a change of configuration stall. At the onset of the stall, the Trident's stall recovery stick push was activated and the control wheel was pushed forward. We can see this in the recorded flight data. The pitch input sharply fell almost immediately following the accidental retraction of the droops. However, as you can see in this graph, 
The next question is, why does the pitch go back up? Inexplicably, the Trident's stall prevention system was manually inhibited during the crisis. It was switched off. Again, we don't know who did it. Regardless, it was allowing the pilots to freely once again pitch the nose up, exacerbating the stall. The Trident being a T-tailed plane, it suffered from a unique quirk of the design that could have further induced the stall. The horizontal stabilizers that control the pitch of the plane could have entered a shadow region behind the wings in a nose-up attitude. This can prevent the necessary airflow reaching the stabilizers. Much like the wings, the stabilizers and its elevators need airflow to function. There have been similar accidents involving T-tail planes where this exact thing played a role. It makes controlling the plane extremely difficult to near impossible. In a high nose-up attitude, the plane fell to the ground at considerable speed. The plane had flown over a reservoir, crossed a major road that runs into London, and crashed into a field between the road and a residential area of Staines. The impact itself killed most people on board the plane. Numerous witnesses, residents, and other members of the public saw the plane come down and first responders quickly arrived on the scene, one of whom was a nurse who was able to attend to two survivors of the initial crash. These two initial survivors were barely alive. They had suffered severe injury from the crash and died before further help could arrive. This devastating accident killed everyone on board the plane. 118 people were now dead. The investigation found numerous shortcomings in the operation of the plane. It was concluded that the captain failed to fly the plane adequately, and his poor performance was quite possibly induced by his subtle incapacitation, as the accident report puts it. But there is more to it than that, if things weren't already bad enough. The impaired physical state of the captain and lack of experience from the co-pilot the multitude of alerts, the stick shaker, stall alarm, and stick pusher could have overwhelmed the pilots to the point that they may not have been able to deduce the problem. Ultimately, the pilots lost control, and moments later, the plane crashed. Many recommendations would come out of this investigation. These included a mandate to require commercial planes to be fitted with a cockpit voice recorder. Even after this accident, not all planes were fitted with one, as it only applied to aircraft over a certain size. The investigation found that pilots could easily confuse the two flap levers on the Trident, so going forward they were to be given different shapes to differentiate the two. Further recommendations were made in the areas of pilot training to highlight the dangers of a change of configuration type of stall. Pilots of the Trident were to be more closely clued in on the workings of the plane's stick shaker and stick pusher stall prevention systems. Criticism was also drawn to the use of the jump seat in the cockpit. Investigators were keen to point out that additional flight crew members that weren't on the job could have distracted the active flight crew members. Not including acts of terrorism, the disaster of Flight 548 was, and still is to this day, the deadliest air disaster to occur within Britain. However, it is not the worst air disaster to involve the United Kingdom or even involve a British plane. Other accidents have occurred since, with substantially higher death counts, and the Trident itself was involved in one of those. Next week, we'll be taking a look at that accident. Well, this is a video I didn't expect to be as long as it's turned out to be. I'm glad we eventually got around to talking about this plane, and this accident had tons to really go over. Lots of different things going on. I can certainly say that I have a newfound love for the Trident. I've learned tons about this plane whilst researching this accident and also the one we're going to be discussing next week. Anyway, hello and welcome to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to be subscribed as there will be another video coming next Saturday. I would like to take a moment to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their continued support to the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive thank you to you. Shout out this week to Swordcat for pledging this week. Thank you so much. It's really appreciated. Thanks. If you yourself would like to support the channel further and even get your name featured here at the end of the next video, 
you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you are a patron and you want to connect with me, you can always shoot me a message on there. I check my messages on Patreon every day. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, the link to that will also be in the pinned comment. If you want more Disaster Breakdown, consider checking out some of the videos that should be on the screen right now. Otherwise, I shall see you next week. That's it from me. Have a great day and goodbye.